One of the most challenging things that any professional photographer is ever going to shoot is a wedding. Not just the shooting portion of it, but then the processing of all of those images and the delivery to your clients, the bride and groom, of their finished images. And that is precisely what we're going to cover in this episode, a wedding end-to-end -end workflow. Let's go. Hi, and welcome to episode 50 of Understanding Dark Table. First up, a bit of a shout out to a viewer, Robert McCutcheon, who sent me an email oh, a week and a half ago now, and he said, loving your video series on Dark Table, and I'm thinking of doing a wedding tutorial type video. And it got me thinking that, yeah, that would be an interesting thing to do. And so I wrote back to him and I said, hey, would you mind if I did that, uh, given that it was his idea? And he said, no, go for it. So, Robert, thank you very much for your blessing. A couple of things that I want to address before we dive into this. Uh, one, cultural differences. I can only speak from my experience having shot weddings in Australia. Okay. And I recognize that Different cultures around the world have completely different approaches to the way weddings work, you know, and there might be things about the way we do weddings in Australia that might seem absolutely foreign to you. Hopefully that won't detract from what I'm going to do with this video, but just bear it in mind, take from it what works for you and what doesn't. Number two, Tiger Woods. Yes, <laughs> the golfer. He wrote a book a few years back, called How I Play Golf. And the reason I mention this is because I remember when he was on the publicity trail for that book, he was very adamant that people understood that the book was not called How To Play Golf. It was called How I Play Golf. And I thought that was relevant because I'm going to discuss what I would do for a workflow for a wedding shoot. But I recognize that not everything that I choose to do in my workflow is going to be appropriate. Some of it will resonate with you and some of it you might just go, seriously, why is he even bothering with that stuff? And that's fine. Cherry pick as you see fit. Okay, with all of that said, the wedding that I'm going to use for this video is a wedding I shot uh, three years ago. It was the last wedding that I shot, uh, mainly because I just don't go chasing wedding work. It's not what I want to do. Uh, I will happily shoot for family and friends. If they ask me to shoot a wedding, I will do it, but it's not the kind of thing I go chasing. So this was the last one that I shot in 2016. Jaden, the groom, is another photographer uh, and a good mate, and he asked me to do it, so I said, yep, not a problem. And Rebecca, his fiancée at the time, was quite happy to have me shoot it as well, so it was a done deal. Now, on the odd occasion that I do shoot a wedding, I make it a point to make sure that I charge enough so that I can hire a second shooter. I personally don't feel and this is just my personal opinion, that one person can adequately cover a wedding. So I had a second shooter, Darren, another photographer from Sydney, and Darren was shooting with an Olympus, EM1, I think it was. So I mention that because it'll become relevant in a sec. So the first thing we need to do is to import our images. Now, I have already processed this wedding and so I don't want to lose or damage the XMP sidecar files that I've already got on my system. So in order to get around that, what I've done is created a temporary folder called EP50, and I have moved all of the raw files into that folder, but left the XMP sidecar files where they currently live. That way I can do the import process now and generate new XMP sidecar files in a new location and not mess up the stuff that I've already got processed, right? 
So it's as if I have come home from the wedding and brought my memory cards and just dumped all of them, all of the files into this folder. So first thing we're going to do is go to the import dialog box. We are going to choose folder. We are going to look in my photos folder. I've got episode 50 and inside that is a folder with the date of the wedding, 2016, October the 15th. Now, some of the stuff that I'm going to cover is things that we have covered in previous videos. I will try to keep any repetition brief because there will be people watching this video who haven't watched all of the prior videos. So on the import options, import directories recursively. That basically says to Darktable, if I check that box, look inside this folder for subfolders. And I don't need to worry about that because inside this folder, there are no subfolders. There is just all of the raw files. So I don't need to check that box. If you had a complex folder structure, if maybe it was a multi-day shoot, you would go up one level and you would then, you know, so you would, you would go back to here and you would say import ep50 and then you would say import directories recursively to tell it to look for the respective day folders within that folder. So I'll, do, I'll just do that. Let's do that. Ignore JPEG files. If Darren and I had chosen to shoot raw plus JPEG, and if I'd brought the memory cards home and dumped the raw and JPEG files onto my system, but I didn't want the JPEGs to be imported into Darktable, I could tick this box and then Darktable would ignore the JPEG files that were in those folders and it would only import the raw files. Again, I don't need to worry because I've only got raw files. Apply metadata on import basically says whatever I have filled in with these four fields apply to every image at import. Now, if I was processing this for real, I would apply all of that metadata. I don't need to do it for this particular video. And I also have a bit of an issue about applying my metadata to the images that Darren shot, because technically they're his images, even though I paid him to shoot. It's his creative work. So anyway, that's a whole other argument. So let's go open. And as we can see in the bottom left hand corner, there is 1462 images to import. Now, some of you who shoot weddings regularly right now are thinking, hang on, there were two of you shooting for a whole day and you only shot 1462 images. Yes, that is correct. Neither Darren nor I are machine gun shooters. Uh, I try to shoot very conservatively. Uh, and you'll actually see when we dive into this collection that out of that 1,462 images, I only shot 450. Darren shot just over 1,000. So I'm twice as conservative as he is. <laughs> So, but that's neither here nor there. You know, everyone has their own style of shooting and, you know, I, I try to be a little measured in the way that I shoot. So I'm not going to make you sit here and wait while Darktable imports all 1,462 images because in the process it also has to generate the thumbnails for all of those images. So I will leave you for a sec and go and make a coffee and then I will come back when Darktable is done. So I'll talk to you in a minute. Okay, I am back and Darktable has finished importing all of those files and we can see that they're all here, all 1400 of them and it hasn't generated all of the thumbnails just yet, but it will get there in time. Now, at the moment, I'm sorted them by color label. I'm gonna change that to file name. So right now, what I have got is all of Darren's images sorted first, because if we have a look at our image information, we can see that he was shooting on an Olympus EM1, and the file names all begin with underscore, the letter A, and then a six or seven digit number, right? Where with my 
Sony RAW files, they all begin with underscore and DSC, which I'm assuming stands for digital Sony camera, maybe? So, sorting by file name, I've got all of Darren's images first and all of my images second. And they are then in chronological order. The first thing I want to do is make sure that the timestamps of our two cameras were synchronised. Now, I'm fairly certain we did synchronise them before we started shooting on the morning of the wedding. In this particular instance, the girls were staying in accommodation at the vineyard where the ceremony and the reception were to take place. So they were there. They were already on site. And so the idea was that Darren would shoot the boys getting ready and I would shoot the girls getting ready. And then when the ceremony started, there would be both of us shooting together and covering everything that transpired through the day. So the best way for me to work out whether or not our cameras are in sync in terms of their timestamp is to find images that are of the same moment in time. And probably the best thing to look for would be the exchanging of the rings or maybe the first kiss after they have been pronounced man and wife. So let's do that. We will scroll down through Darren's images until we get to the ceremony. Here we go. So it looks like we've got exchanging of the rings happening here. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. Here's the first kiss right here. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to choose that image and I'm going to press F1 and that will give that image the color label red. And we can see the little red dot on the thumbnail right here. So what I need to do now is find a similar image from my photos, which will be down the tail end of my collection here, and make sure that they were taken at around about the same time in terms of the timestamp. So just wait for Darktable to generate some thumbnails. Okay, so here we go. Here's the first image that I shot of their first kiss as man and wife. So, again, F1 to give this a color label of red. So now I've got those two images. I want to see them side by side so that I can compare their timestamps. And that is where we would change our sort method to color label. Click on that press the letter G in order to jump back to the beginning of our collection. And there's our two images. So I've got the ORF, the Olympus RAW file from Darren's camera, and then the ARW RAW file from my Sony A850. So if we look at the timestamp of Darren's image, 15th of October, 2016 at 3.24 and 31 seconds in the afternoon. If we look at the timestamp of mine, it is 3.25.07, but the wrong day. Don't ask me how I managed to get the day wrong on the time set up for my camera, but somehow I was one whole day out. Now, you might think, well, that's not really that big an issue, is it? Well, it will be when I sort the entire collection chronologically and I expect all of my images to be roughly synchronized. So I've done a little bit of mental calculation and I've worked out that my camera is 23 hours, 59 minutes and I think it was about 24 seconds behind Darren's camera. So I need to create an offset for all of my images. So before I do anything else, I will switch back to file name. Now, in terms of the current collection, 
It's basically appearing as a film roll. Whenever you import images into Darktable, it becomes a film roll with the date that you imported those images. But I want to be a little bit more specific, so I'm going to save this collection and I'm going to call store new preset and I'll go J and B for Jaden and Beck and I'll go all. So that is a collection of images which comprises all of the images from the shoot. What I want to do now though is just get the images that I shot on my A850. So what I'm going to do is click on this little down arrow, go narrow down search, select camera from this drop down list, and as we can see, two different cameras were used, an Olympus EM1 and a Sony A850. So I'm going to double click the Sony A850, and now all I'm seeing is just my images. And I could then choose to save that as its own collection if I wanted to. I'm not going to bother though. So now I've got all of my images. Now I need to create a time offset. So I will go control A to select all of the images. And then I come over here to the geotagging module. And as you can see, I've already done this once before. So I'm going to add 23 hours, 59 minutes and 24 seconds to the timestamp of all of my images. And that should bring all of my shoot into sync with Darren's images. So to do that, I simply click on this little tick or check mark on the right hand side and that will apply the time offset to selected images. So click on that, adding time offset to 400 and however many images. So that is now done. So if I now go back to this collection, Jaden and Beck, all, and if I sort by time, I should be able to go down to where that first kiss occurred and hopefully my image and Darren's image will be sitting side by side. And look, there they are. Two red dots side by side. So that is how you can synchronize the images from multiple cameras if the time had not been set in camera before everybody started shooting. Now that that's done, we can move on to the next step. And for me, that is tagging. Now, am I going to tag every person that's in these images? Absolutely not. I am not going to go through 1400 images individually and tag everybody that I know. That's just too much effort. What I will do is go back to sorting by file name so I can see all of Darren's images first because the boys were in the town of Orange in New South Wales at Jaden's house and they were getting ready there. So what I'm going to do is all of those images which were shot at Darren's house, which is everything down to there, I want to tag those with the location, which was orange. So I would go to my tagging. I'm going to type in orange, capitalized. And here it is, Australia, New South Wales, orange. Darktable already recognizes that I've processed these images before, and that's why the keyword already appears in my collection. If that tag didn't already exist, what I could have done was in this field here is type Australia, the pipe symbol, which is in between the backspace and the enter key on my keyboard, uh, then New South Wales, then the pipe symbol again, and then orange. And if that didn't already exist, I would then have the option to create that as a new keyword. Obviously, I already have it, so I don't need to worry. So I will double click on that option, and that tag has now been added to all of these selected images. Every image after that was shot 
at the vineyard where the wedding took place. So I'm going to select that next image. For some reason, Darren shot three images of his car. I <laughs> don't know why. Okay, and then I'm going to scroll right down to the end of the collection, shift and click, and that has selected all of the rest of the shoot. And now I can add Australia, New South Wales, Orange, Mayfield Winery, which was the venue for this wedding and add that tag to all of those images, which has now occurred. Now, like I said, this might be one of those things that to you is not that important. I like to do it because it means that I can always find the images if I remember where they were shot by simply searching for the name of the venue, or conversely, I might go, I remember shooting a wedding for Jaden and Beck and it was a really great location, but I don't remember what the place was called. And I can come back to their shoot and find that, oh, I tagged it. Oh, it was Mayfield Winery. It was at Orange. So, you know, that's just me. I like to tag everything. You may have a different point of view and that's perfectly fine. Another thing that I've not yet done a video on is the map view in... Dark table. Now that appears under this little drop down in the top right hand corner. And if you click on map, you will actually get to see a map. And you can choose which map provider you want to use. I'm using Google Maps. And you can see that I have thumbnails appearing in places where I have shot images. And the way this works. You'll notice I have not yet put Sri Lanka and the Maldives in there. I'm a little bit slack. Okay, so what we're going to do is zoom in to where I shot this wedding, which was orange. Now, I don't remember exactly where Jaden's house was. And even if I did, I would want to hide it for the purposes of this video. But just to demonstrate, I will go control F to display my film strip. I will select that last image from Darren's camera and I then need to go all the way back to the start of this set of images. I don't know why I'm not seeing a scroll bar underneath. It's probably just hidden by my task bar, but we're almost there. And there we go. So shift and click. So now, I've got all of the images that were shot at Jaden's place. And all I need to do is simply left click and drag onto the map and drop the images. And what will happen is this little collection of thumbnails will appear on the map. Okay, so next up, I need to select all of the other images and Unfortunately, this is going to be rather painful because I can't select the first image and then just scroll to the back end with a scroll bar, which I should be able to just grab and traverse the whole collection. And for some reason, I can't. So I'm just going to do this. And when I get to the end, shift, and now I've got all of the images that were shot at the winery selected and now I can jump back to the map and so what I can do is I can zoom in to Mayfield Vineyard click and drag and drop my collection of images onto the map at Mayfield Vineyard and so that just gives me an easy way of seeing where in the world I was when I shot those images and I think, don't quote me, but I think what happens is within the XMP sidecar files, Darktable will actually add GPS coordinates for those images according to where you've dropped them on the map. And presumably when you export JPEGs from Darktable, if you include the metadata, then that GPS location data should go with your JPEGs as well, I think, don't quote me. So that's the map view. Next up, 
Let's just jump back to our grid view. At this point, I'm ready to start looking at processing the images. And for me, it would be a case of hitting G, going to my first image and pressing Shift and Z. And what I can now do is using the one to five keys above my Q, W, E, R, and T keys, is I can decide if I want to give a star rating to every image. So images that I think are no good, I might just rate as a one star, or maybe I'll even hit the R key to flag them as a reject. So when it comes to using the reject feature, for me personally, I'll only do that if something really tragic happened with the image, like the camera released without focus, or I had the lens pointed at my feet while I was trying to do something with the camera and I've accidentally taken a frame and I've got a photo of my shoes. You know, things like that obviously are not relevant. An image like this that I'm probably not going to use, I'll still give it a one star rating. So I'd go one and that image has now been given a one star rating, right? And then I can just use my left and right arrow keys to jump through all of the images. And I might go, well, that's better exposed. I'll give that two stars. And then I can just keep on working my way through all of these images. And when I find stuff that I like, I'll go, yeah, that's good. That's three stars. I will probably do something with that image later on. And then it is just a process of going through all 1,460 odd images and applying a star rating for all of those images or an R as a reject for those that are just complete and utter crap. Once again, I am not going to subject you to watching me go through 1400 images and applying star ratings because once you've seen it done once, you don't need to see it 1400 times. Hopefully you learn a little bit quicker than that. Okay. So let's just assume that I have now gone through all 1,462 images and I have created star ratings for the images that I want to work with. And I've given them a number of stars according to my immediate thoughts on their usefulness as an image, right? So now I can hit the Z key and jump back to my grid view. I guess now we need to sort of have a bit of a discussion about how do you use color labels and when do you use color labels and could you use color labels instead of star ratings? And the answer is absolutely. Whatever works for you is great. You know, if using colors to determine, hey, all of my red ones are duds and all of my blue ones are the images that I'm going to work on and I'm going to actually process and deliver to the clients, great. Use, use that schema. If that works for you, do it. If you like the idea of star ratings, do that. Uh, there's really no right and wrong there. These tools are just there for you to work with whatever makes sense. Okay, so once you've done that, you will hopefully have a bunch of images that you feel are contenders that you can then go ahead and process up ready to present to your clients. I'm not going to do developing of images as part of this video because that's what the rest of this series has been about. And you don't need to see me do all that stuff again. And, you know, even if I'd chosen 100 images out of these 1,400, you don't even want to watch me post-process five of those images. That would just be boring. So I'm not going to do the processing. I will stop the video and I will process half a dozen images, and then we'll move on to the final section of this video. So, back in a sec. Now, I've just <laughs> picked very quickly uh, a few images and processed them very roughly. I will confess I have not spent a whole lot of time on them because I don't want to be here all night. So, now I have theoretically gone and processed all 1,460 odd images and I've narrowed it down to a collection of images that I am comfortable to present to the bride and groom. 
what's my next step? Okay, my thing would be to go to view and drop this down and depending on what star rating you decided to give all of your hero images, you might think you would default to five, but I don't. I always default to three. I always go for the middle ground because then I've got room to either demote or promote certain images. So in this instance, I have used three stars for my images. So I would select my three star images and these are the images that I have processed and I've decided this is what I'm going to present to my clients. Okay. So now the question is, what have you promised? What contract did you enter into with your bride and groom? Was the arrangement that you were only going to provide digital files for them and they would handle any printing that they want to do for themselves? Or are you preparing a wedding album or a photo book on their behalf? All of those questions should be asked and agreed upon long before you get to the wedding and start shooting. In this particular instance, it was agreed with Jaden and Beck that I would simply hand over digital files and they would do as they saw fit with them. And I was quite happy to do that because I really didn't feel like putting the wedding album together anyway. So if that's the case, I probably want to prepare two sets of digital files for them. One would be a set of high res 16 bit TIFFs that they can then use to go and get printed. And that might be they want to print big canvases to hang on the wall, or it might be that they just want to print a nice 11 by 14 on paper and hang in a frame. Or it might be that they're going to do something else with them. I don't know. Who knows? As well as some low res JPEGs that they can use for social media. They can use to email family and friends who may have traveled a long way to be at the wedding on the day and they want to see you know what the official photographers came up with so they want to be able to email those pics so for me i want to create two sets of images so what i would do is i would go to my export selected module first up i'm going to select all of my images because i do want to export all of them and then I'm going to create a couple of different presets for my export selected module. First up, I'm going to choose file on disk. We only covered this a couple of episodes ago, so this should all be fresh in your mind. Next up, I want to choose a folder. So I'll go to my pictures folder and I'm going to go J and B large and select as output destination. And so we can now see home, Bruce, pictures, JMB large, string and file name. So basically I am not changing the file name of the original photos. I'm just leaving them with the camera generated names. Now, if you want to rename your images, that's entirely up to you. And there are tools for doing that. Uh, again, I would point you to rapid photo downloader uh, by Damon Lynch, which I have mentioned in the past, uh, if you're on Linux. Uh, but there are a number of tools around if you want to rename your images. So on conflict, create unique file name. That simply means that if you go to export your images a second time and you're going to the same folder where you exported the first time, Darktable wants to know when I find existing files in that location, what should I do? Do I overwrite or do I create a unique file name? The moment you do any export, this will always revert back to create unique file name. I want to choose TIFF because this is the large versions that I'm exporting. So we'll go TIFF, we'll go 16 bit uncompressed, and for size, I will leave both of these fields at zero. And what that means is that Darktable will export these images at their original resolution, whatever size came out of the camera, after they've been cropped in the Darkroom module, of course. Uh, allow upscaling? No, because I don't want to make them any larger than their native resolution. Profile? 
I'm just going to leave that on sRGB. I don't think there would be a reason for changing to another profile. I'm going to leave intent. I'm going to leave style. We covered all this in a couple of videos back. And what I would then do is go presets, store new preset, and I would go JMB large. And that way, if I ever decide down the track that, hey, I want to add some more images, you know, maybe I sent the images off to Jaden and Beck and they came back to me and they said, oh, you, you took this really nice shot of us standing by the cake when we were just about to cut the cake. Have, have you got that? I could then go back, find that image, process it up, and then I would be able to come back to my export selected module, choose that preset and know that every single setting there was exactly the same as what I had when I exported the rest of the shoot the first time right and so now i simply click on export and it tells me it's exporting 11 images for me now once it has done that export i then want to create a second export for the low res stuff the stuff that they can use for email and social media so what i would do is i would come back to here and i will go back to my pictures folder and i will go J and B small. Create and set as output destination. Now I don't want to do TIFFs, I want to do JPEGs. So I'll go JPEG. I can choose a compression level and I might think, well, they're going to use these for social media. We probably want not too much compression because they're going to get recompressed when they post them to Instagram, Facebook, whatever. At the same time, they want to email these around, so we don't want them to be too large. So I might just set this at 85. So I'll right click on the quality slider, go 85, press enter. And now I've set my compression level for the JPEGs. And I might set a maximum size where the long edge is, let's say 2000 pixels, because that's large enough for social and email. And so now I want to store another preset and I'll call this J and B small. And so now we have our preset for the small images and we can click on export and those 11 small images will be exported. And we can then jump over to our file manager, look in our pictures folder. Here's our large TIFFs, which are 90 odd or 147 megs in size depending on which camera they came from and our small images which are all around about one megabyte in size all right so we should just have a quick look at the print dialog so we'll come over to print because we were looking at just those 11 images that i have processed in the light table view if we bring up the film strip here in the print module you'll see that we are looking at the same collection of images here you can hear my printer just starting up in the background so i will hide those as we can see we can choose our printer mine has shown up we can choose what type of paper we are going to print to and that'll depend on what sort of paper you have if you have a printer profile you will see a tooltip here that tells you the path in which those profiles should live so if you've gone out onto the web and found a custom color profile for your printer you can download it to the correct folder and then Darktable will be able to read that color print profile then we've got intent and i will confess i've not yet looked into any of this stuff i'm going to assume that the defaults are a good place to start then in terms of your page you can choose the page size you can choose the orientation you can then choose the size of borders and you can choose to make things larger or smaller by adjusting these boundaries as you see fit and i will let you play with that and work that out you can then choose the alignment where you want the image to appear on the page so you may want it dead center or you may not. It will depend on your printer and the paper that you're using. Then you've got actual print settings. 
So in terms of profile, you can change the profile at the time of printing if you want to. So while you might have been working in sRGB whilst you were processing your images, and maybe you shouldn't, maybe you should have been working in a larger color space, like a, something like Profoto or whatever, uh, you could then change that profile at the time of printing through this drop down option. Again, you can change the intent. Again, I'm going to confess to not know a whole lot about that. And if you have created a certain style and saved that in your styles module over here in the light table view, you can choose to add one of those styles at the time of printing, because you'll see that all of these styles are the same as what I had in the light table view in the styles module. And then you click on print and off you go. So that is a very quick run through of print module. Like I said, I really haven't spent any time looking at it. I don't tend to print photos at home. If I want stuff printed physically, I will go and pay a print service to do it because they've got the right kind of stuff to make it look fantastic. And these days it's as cheap as chips to get it done. Okay. I am going to leave that here. This has probably already been like the longest video of this entire series. And for that, I apologize. Hopefully it has been of value to you. And hopefully it's shown you a couple of things you may not have already known. It's probably shown you a whole lot you already did know. Hopefully it maybe refreshed some things you'd forgotten from earlier videos. Any questions, comments on feedback, please sing out in the comments down below. And yeah, I think that pretty much does it for this one. I will see you in the next one.